You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. And welcome to another uh, RN Mentor podcast. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Patricia Davidson with us. Uh, she is the Dean and Professor at John Hopkins University School of Nursing. She is Secretary General of the Secretariat of the World Health uh, Organization's Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery, Council General of the International Council on Women's Health Issues, a member of Sigma Theta Tau's International Institute for Global Healthcare Leadership Advisory Board, and a board member of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Uh, she also serves uh, on the board on healthcare services for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. She has co-authored hundreds, uh, over 500, of peer-reviewed journal articles and 29 book chapters, recipient of the Outstanding Mentor of Young Researchers, the Most Prestigious Research Mentorship Award in Australia. She is Associate Editor of the International Journal of Nursing Studies, and on the editorial board of a number of other journals, including the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing, Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing, and Heart, Lung, and Circulation. And I believe your background is all also in uh, the cardiovascular system. Yeah. So welcome, uh, Dr. Davidson, to the show. So thank you so much, Dr. Tayyip, for having me. And in Nurses Week, it's very exciting. Yes, yes. Thank you uh, for joining us. Um, so uh, I always like to start with my guests as and say, uh, how did you get into the profession of nursing? Where did you get your start? Well, it's probably this is probably not the usual um, answer you're going to get. Um, so when I was at school, you were kind of pretty channeled um, into careers. So, you know, I actually happened to go to a private girls' school and was reasonably smart. So, you know, I was destined for a career in law or journalism. That was kind of where my teachers were sending me. And, and it was really in my last year of high school that my mother died of ovarian cancer. Until at that time... I'd never really thought of nursing as an option. And as that year played out and my mother died, um, yes, I went to school to do, you know, to university, Destin, but as in many of those really chaotic personal situations, I dropped out of school and I was waitressing and I soon worked out that was not going to be my life's calling. And I was working with a... Uh, a young woman, and in fact, she was an American, and she said, you know, I'm going to go to nursing. And I think we don't know how our brain works, but clearly some way in my mind, I'd nursing, the, observing the nurses in the care of my mother was sort of embedded somehow. And, you know, as I've now had time to reflect on that as talking to people like you, you know, I actually clearly remember at the time being... Um, sorry about that, being uh, jealous of the nurses who I felt could be close to my mother and give her comfort, whereas as a 16-year-old, I felt powerless. And so that's how I came into nursing. So never, never a young girl who had this dream or vision. And I went to nursing school in the sort of mid-70s into a system that was just so different to university in the 70s. So I'd been to the Australian National University at the, you know, just as in the midst of Vietnam War protests and lots of freedom 
And then I went to nursing school, uh, which was a diploma program, and I'm proudly a, started as a diploma graduate because nursing didn't go into the universities until 1985 in Australia. So I went to this very nightingale sort of school with, you know, the uniform and the hats, and I look back, and then my first assignment I put in, I remember them crossing out my name and putting R-N, but in spite of that um, difficult uh, sort of transition of cultures, I love nursing from the very minute. I love nurses. Many of those people that I went to school with are still my dear friends, and it is a profession that I have just grown to love more and more every day. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so uh, did you... Uh, did you start in cardiovascular nursing? Because I know that's where your background is. Uh, but how did you get into that? Uh, so, in fact, I really aged with the, I'd say I've aged with the patients. So, um, I started off in working in critical care. And you remember in the, the mid to late 70s, or really um, was pre-thrombolytic. So, in coronary care, you would have people dying every shift and often men in their 50s in their prime. And so I, I went and worked in critical care. I worked in intensive care for probably a good, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and then my, I worked um, as, as a heart failure nurse um, as part of a research study, and that's really which totally switched me on to cardiology um, but I think intensive care is such a great background for anything because it's it's really multi-organ. <laughs> We're not married to one organ. And I came from that background and interested going into cardiology, particularly in the 80s. It was all about the heart and the heart rhythm. But we know now in the era of multimorbidity, cardiovascular medicine, and particularly now um, in hospitals is really about the care of the elderly with cardiovascular disease, and it's very much a multi-organ disease. Um, so my area uh, of starting in cardiology and acute critical care sort of really led me to where my real kind of passion is and work now is in um, community-based heart failure programs or that tr transition between acute care and the community but more importantly, um, palliative care and heart failure. Because I think as a nurse dealing with people with heart failure, you cannot ignore the issues of death and dying. Absolutely. Um, so as, we're, uh, as you transition through uh, your career, um, how, did you, how did you find your path to where you are today? And uh, was, it, was it planned? Uh, were you guided? Uh, how, did you, uh, how did you get to where you are? So that was very much a serendipitous route. And I think, you know, you look back in your career and you look back at your life and thought, you know, probably, you know, I was sort of had some leadership attributes. You ask my husband, he would say, I'm very bossy. <laughs> if I look back at high school, you know, I was the vice captain of the school. And so I'd always, um, I think, was curious and focused and maybe ambitious. That's probably a good way to put it. And there's nothing wrong with ambition. Um, but how my career totally changed was really from someone seeing some, something in me and having the resources to follow through. So I had many fabulous mentors in my nursing career, and I'm sure many of them saw many attributes in me. But when I was working as a heart failure nurse, actually doing in the early trials of the Carvedilol studies, um, the cardiologist who was ran the clinic, he called me into his office one day, and I really thought I was in trouble because he was not always warm and fuzzy. And he just looked at me. He said, you have to go to the American Heart Association meeting. So you can remember, you know, this is now, you know, um, mid-80s in Australia, um, the th and nursing was at a very different time. Remember, nursing didn't go into the universities till 1985. And probably compared to many nurses, you know, if you're a nurse, a clinical nurse, and you go and there's coffee in the break room or there's leftover pizza, that's a great day. 
But have someone say, I want to send you to the American Heart Association and just because he said, saw something in me. So that was a very important lesson to me is that you can't, many people, you need the resources to support and enable someone. But even more serendipitous was I went to this, um, to the meeting and it was in Atlanta in the mid eighties. So, you know, I was the typical nurse. I said, no, I, you know, I'm not staying in that hotel. You know, I can stay in a cheaper place. I've learned a few things to say. And um, so I got to Atlanta in the mid eighties and, you know, I was across the road from the Greyhound bus terminal. So that probably tells you something about it, but also coming from Australia at that time, I was very naive, but a very formative experience happened. So I go to the uh, um, American Heart Association meeting and we need a uh, talk on acute coronary syndrome. And I look, this, this talk is really inspiring. And I'm not sure what really, ins- what did inspire me, I know, was, was very focused on pathophysiology and the science, but it was also really had the dimensions of the individual and the family. So I looked down at this program and, you know, I'm, I don't know anything. You know, I've come from clinical, I'm not an academic, I'm not learning journals. And it's Kathleen Drake. I thought, she's a nurse. Amazing. Imagine that. And in the main program, because at that stage in Australia, nursing was part of the meetings, but was always a satellite on the Sunday. Nurses were not presenting in the main meeting. And I just thought, wow. She is amazing. And apart from the fact that there was this tall, blonde, elegant woman, articulate, and I thought, oh, I could never be like that. You know, I've got kids and all the rest of it. So um, this is pre-internet, pre-everything. And th- I reached out to her. So I had to write her a letter, in fact. Um, uh, you know, people would think differently. And I just said, you know, I was just so inspired and motivated. And she said, well, look, I'm going to be in Australia in three months or so, four months. So I took her out to dinner and then she said to me, she told me her story and she has five children. And I just thought, look, I just have to get on with it. So she has been my mentor ever since. I think, um, you know, I'm very fortunate in my career. I feel like I've been able to have everything. I've been able to be a mother. I've been able to be a professor. But sometimes you just can't do everything the same. Um, So I, for example, did my PhD part-time. But, you know, I did it part-time, working full-time as probably – Many people were listening to this, you know, so, you know, sometimes I I look at what is a planned trajectory and it doesn't, it doesn't actually end up being there. But also, you know, what actually started me on my PhD was yet I, when the Carvedilol trial was unblinded, and as you know, that was a big, for beta blockers in heart failure, it was a big change in paradigms because previously beta blockers had been contraindicated. But many patients on the trial in the placebo group actually did better than they you know, would have, which is the same in most trials. So there's a presentation of the findings that everybody's talking about, this placebo effect. And I thought, this is not the placebo effect. This is caring and organisation, and this is nursing care. So that's what set me on to do my PhD and, you know, hence my relationship with Kathy Draker and Barbara Regal and Deborah Mosher, many of the giants in the field, you know, where um, I was quickly trying to catch up to them in terms of the science. So, yeah, that's what took me to do my PhD. I did it part-time. And I, because I couldn't do a postdoc, um, Basically, you know, I couldn't afford afford that. So I would go from Australia to UCSF to see Kathy once a year in the summer and I would be there. And so she's been just incredibly generous to me as a mentor. So, you know, if people are saying, you know, reach out and ask because the worst thing that people can say is, sorry, no, I don't have the time. But more often than not, people will embrace you and help you on the journey. 
that's a that's a fantastic uh fantastic story uh really love the fact that you know you reached out and you were in australia so yeah uh, that's 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 huge because like you know one of the reasons i'm doing this podcast because people don't always have an opportunity to uh hear other people speak uh, especially people who have potentially could potentially be mentors or uh, you know sort of a guiding light as where you want your career to go so that's fantastic that you were able to do that and Kathy was able to uh, meet with you and you know yeah. have to really accommodate very interesting that you brought up the postdoc because I've you know I'm in a situation where I can't do a postdoc uh, you know just because you know a family and can't move and uh, opportunities and things like that. So uh, I'm happy to hear it's you can have a fulfilling career without a postdoc. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, in fact, you know, part of it, you know, one of the great things about getting older and, um, and in the later years of your career, so, you know, I was at the doctoral education conference, the AACN doctoral conference, and everyone is so serious about what's, what it is. So I got up and I said, you know, I'm Trish Davidson. I'm a diploma nurse. I did PhD part-time and I didn't do a postdoc. <laughs> and I'm now the dean at Johns Hopkins. Go figure. That's not bad. Not too shabby, I would say. <laughs> not, too <bad. laughs> not too shabby. So I've been very fortunate, but also worked very hard. Yes, I'm sure. And that's one thing I wanted to actually talk talk to you about. Uh, I mean, looking at your uh, looking at your bio, you have managed to accomplish so much, still have a family. Uh, like, how do you how do you juggle that for somebody? I mean, I look at it from my perspective. I mean, that's the only perspective I can speak to in reality. Uh, and I struggle at times doing everything and with family and obligations. How do you do that? How do you? manage that well firstly i think you've got to love really love what you do and so i'm a bit of a nerd so you know being alone with my computer and writing is my idea of heaven a fresh data set so i think intrinsically i love it and so it's not a chore so you know i have faculty and they come and say to me how many manuscripts should do i need to me, that's like, I say, how many do you think you need? So as I look around, you know, I think the biggest thing for people is to be happy in themselves and be happy where you are in the, in the ecosystem. Um, sometimes some people say I'm scary, but because I, I think I give people the real information. So if someone's coming on the research track at Hopkins and they want to be successful, you know, I say... You know, you need 10 publications. You should be shooting for 10 publications a year. In depth. You know, some will be out, some will be under review. And people are shocked. But I know that's what it's going to take. And I think some of the worst things that people can talk about to people is about, well, you need to get a balance and you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, that's, to me, that we need to change the system. But the reality is that is what's expected. And regardless of where you're at, I think to be, you know, to for nursing, you've got to be really good to be successful. And, um, and th that's part of it. So the other thing is not everybody has to be the PI of a study. And not everybody has to be, you know, at the top. And you know, one of the most important lessons I learned in my life about leadership and teams was being the manager of my daughter's basketball team. So my daughter, unlike me, is tall and athletic and blonde. But, um, she was a very good basketballer and she played for the state. And I was in hot demand to be the manager of the team. And the reasons for that are, I think, Firstly, I like kids. I was a nurse. I knew first aid. You cook out of an electric, you know, an electric frying pan. You know, my family's Lebanese, so quantities are never an issue. And but the most important thing, my most important characteristic was I knew nothing about basketball and I didn't want to be the coach. 
I knew my job was to look after those girls. And I learned so much about the team. I just learned that you can be that super, super person who, you know, wants to do the three-point down the field, or but there's got to be a team. And then the other thing that I really noticed is how the people on the bench can change the direction of a game just by supporting their colleagues. So that's what I think healthcare is about. And that's what I think, say, academic nursing is about. You know, there's two people in my school who are the only two masters, um, you know, everyone else is doctorally prepared, the only two masters. They're probably two of the best faculty that we have. They uh, are fabulous. They're great teachers. The student love, love them. And they celebrate everyone else's success. So it's not that we have some people who, who, aren't, who aren't doing what it takes, but it's everyone else's fault. You know, too much teaching, too much whatever. Um, so in my life, I've always kind of had, a, you know, a bit of a priority. I think work is first. I mean, sorry, family is first. That is absolutely true. And there was a period where when my kids were little, I worked night shift and weekends because family's first. And um, I just think that's there. And you just got to be happy in yourself. You know, there's always people that are doing better and people doing worse than you. So I think being happy within yourself is the most important thing. And we don't all have to be the same. And what your dean thinks of you or what an NIH study section thinks of you doesn't define who you are and the work that you do. But that takes, I can say that because I'm 63 years of age, you know, for people starting off 34, you know, I went through many periods of insecurity, of reproaching myself for whatever. And people now say, you know, what would you say to other people? And I say, just don't be so hard on yourself. And it's a long game. And particularly when you've got children or elderly parents, that they're things that you, they're going to go, trust me, they're going to go. And um, so you have to focus on that. Uh, and, you know, sure, I'm doing well, but there's people doing a whole lot better than me. So that, but it's, it's really that self-actualization, that Maslow's hierarchy, it takes you know, a bit of blood, sweat and tears to get to that point where you feel comfortable. Um, but that's one of the things that I really strive for in building in the school is a culture of celebration and celebration and realism. You know, as I said, you know, um, particularly if you come to a place like Hopkins, you know, and in a very interdisciplinary setting, if you're going up for promotion, someone from the School of Public Health, someone from the School of Medicine so I is reviewing the portfolio. So I think I'm doing people a disservice if not telling them what it takes. And I'm just another small story um, which really made me understand this. And one thing that I've really tried with students is to understand the real dynamics of work. Um, so... When I was working in the ICU, one of the fellows was going off to interview to get into OBGYN. And he was a, a guy from the country. And they came in the next day, he said, we said, how'd you go? You know, he said, I knew I didn't get it. I knew I wouldn't get it as soon as I walked in the room. And I said, why, why is that? He said, I wore a safari suit. Now you're too young, Google safari suit, but I'm talking about the 70s. And this is like this khaki thing with, you know, patches, which was very height of fashion. But he walks into a room and there's all these guys in navy blazers, gold buttons and khaki pants. So someone didn't tell him the rules of the club. Now, whether you decide to abide by the rules or not, you should know them. So that's one of the other things that I think I would reflect. You know, if people look back, um, I reached out, I took risks. And you have to, even if you think you're an introvert, you have to reach out. So um, I really 
my doctoral students, whatever, I'm really big on social occasions. Again, probably comes back to my Lebanese upbringings, but more importantly, you rem- where does the business happen in conferences? doesn't happen in the meetings. It happens in the meetings around the meetings. So if you're refusing an invitation to dinner, you're potentially refusing an opportunity. Now, this is hard because intrinsically people are often shy. And, you know, I know some people would think I'm not, I'm pretty out there, but my favourite place to be is actually where I'm sitting at the moment, just on the couch. Um, I think they're the things, it's, it's like the unspoken things that people need to know. And that's why mentorship and sponsorship are so crucial and you really, you know, need to, to think about that. Um, and say, for example, we, I have, you know, in days where you could have people, you invite students to your home, and if people don't reply or don't respond, actually speak to them, and not because I am cross or whatever, but I just want them to know that other, you know, I'm not going to think the worst of you, but someone else might. Um, and I think particularly as we look at how, um, you know, how we really get diversity, equity and inclusion, you know, if you're lucky to come from the white middle class, you understand the rules, you understand the game. But for many people that come from different countries or have different things, um, it can be, so you need someone that's going to help show you the way. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, introversion, and I'm I'm a huge introvert, and the fact that I'm doing a podcast is very out of my comfort zone. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I want to speak to that uh, the component of networking because that's what you touched upon. And I was tell my students or anybody that's asked, I said, why should you why should you go to a conference or why should you go to a meeting? Um, I always say it's really not. You get content, but that content will eventually come out in a journal or something, and you'll eventually be privy to it. However, you don't have that opportunity to network as much. And that's where you find people that can mentor you, even if it's for one thing. Uh, yeah. um, it's it, Or they, if they can even open a door or even introduce you to someone uh, that can potentially m- mentor you, I think that's, that's a huge component. Um, Absolutely. I do have a question when it comes to... Uh, 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 conferences Um, because looking at uh, the various states and the income level of nurses whether they're in academia or in states that don't pay as much conferences have kind of risen in how much they cost I mean thousands of dollars if you're just going to go to a couple of days between the hotel food travel Uh, Mm -hmm. how do we build what's and and I don't know if you have the answer to this, but how do we build well, equity in in conferences? Well, I think you've made an excellent point. And, you know, the other thing is the reason that I was able to go and spend, you know, um, a, a couple of weeks a year with Kathy in San Francisco from Australia was, you know, I had, you know, a partner who supported me and we could do it. So what I'm really hoping is that... Um, COVID-19 will re, refocus us on what's important and not just jetting around the world. And that's coming from someone who spends a lot of time jetting around the world. Um, the other thing is, you know, I often say to students, look, if you want to go to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower, do that. But don't go to present a paper unless it's in, you're invited and it's the European Society of Cardiology. Because as we know, they don't count Papers don't count on your CV, you know, for promotion in most sort of universities, unless they're converted to a publication. So one of the common things that I see as, you know, a dean that looking at CVs is, you know, there might be two pages of, um, of uh, conference presentations and three publications. And it's interesting, um, you know, Eileen Larson, who is at, um, just retired from uh, Columbia or NYU, anyway, one of those, in New York, a very, and a, a living legend, Marie Nolan, who's my executive vice dean, 
said that years and years ago she, she gave her some really good advice. Um, she said, you know, if you if it's a conference presentation and you haven't published it, people will see that you don't follow through. So, and then the other thing is about conferences. You know, I'm thinking when I started in cardiology, you know, there was the American Heart Association. And now you look, there's the Heart Face Society of America, there's PCNA, um, and that's just, and then there's the, you know, Epi, Epi AHA and the American College of Cardiology. So there's just so many. And this is another word of wisdom from Ginger Carreri Coleman, who was at UCSF. I remember her saying to me once, Trish, you know, for many conferences, if it's not illegal or amoral, they'll accept it because if you're accepted, no one will pay to go. So I think as a currency, the conference is going to be really uh, change in all of this. I think COVID-19 is going to maybe be the disruptor that we need. Um, I see, see many conferences going on uh, via Zoom, which is not ideal. But, you know, I'll often say to doctoral students, you know, if, you, if you're if shopping around, you know, go to, if anyone ever want to come to Hopkins for a few days, very welcome to come to look around. But that might be money better spent than, you know, going to a conference. So I agree it's a real issue and, um, and it's something that we do need to address in the profession. But, again, that can be a thing about sponsorship. There can be a lot of money out there. And I see some of my students who are just incredibly smart at cobbling together. Um, some people end up with a free ride and whatever because they've cobbled it together. But again, if you don't know the system, if you don't know where to look, if no one's not, and if someone's not writing you good letters of support, you don't get it. So again, it comes about down to networking, um, and all of those things are really important. Because letters of recommendation and things do matter. You know, of many things that, um, you know, that's something that I've, you know, and often people, you'll see it probably in your own students or in your own colleagues, you know, they think the letter of recommendation is something at the last minute and say, you know, Trish Davidson thinks this is a good idea. We know that good letters of support take hours to write and shouldn't be an afterthought. And it's similarly the same for um, for scholarships. Uh, people look at the quality of the letters of support and the the and who they come from. I, I completely agree with that with that piece. I always tell um, my students who've uh, sort of been uh, sort of not engaged. Uh, and last minute they show up and say, right, can you write me a letter? I need it by next week. I'm like, I, I don't know enough about you. So that, again, going back to that networking with the people that you uh, you may need or can open a door for you or may need a letter from, uh, it's important to get to know them and they get to know you. So I completely 100% agree with that. Um, so uh, you are uh, currently in a leadership position at a university with uh, with incredible rankings when it comes to schools of nursing. Uh, uh, what is your leadership style and what do you attribute uh, the success of the program to? Well, you probably should ask the faculty that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, right. you know, I should ask maybe what did, what would the faculty say about that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what doc, people have told my some of my doctoral students have said school of tough love. I think one thing is, um, you know, and I'll talk about the school in a minute, but, you know, I came to the U.S. when I was 57, 58. And so I, no one in my life had told me I was direct. Um but now so many people say to me, you're very direct. So I think that's an Australian thing. But, you know, about Hopkins, you know, really I stand on the shoulders of giants and, and that is kind of no exaggeration. From Isabel Hampton Robb, the first superintendent, through to Dean Martha Hill, who was my predecessor, who um, 
uh, you know, was the first known physician to be ever the president of the American Heart Association and certainly, a, you know, a fabulous um, scientist and nurse and, and mentor to many. Um, but, you know, the rankings just don't come by nothing. So, you, you know, it's part of you've got to be strategic just like anything else. You've got to make sure that you are making sure your faculty are members of the, you know, prestigious organisations. You need to keep your grant income strong. You have to make sure that you have good student outcomes. So many of those things are the metrics of every good school. Um, and then the other great thing at Hopkins is that we are rich enough to tell the world about what we do. And so marketing, communication, social media, those things are really important. Look, there's many great schools of nursing in the United States. And, you know, I'm very grateful for our rankings. Um, but, you know, in terms of leadership, you've got to be focused and strategic. Um, in my, and you've got to read, you've got to uh, sort of read the future to a certain extent. Uh, one of the things that we've done during my tenure, and it really came from Dean Hill, is that we moved all of our pre-licensure programs to the master's level. Um, in fact, you know, my first day at work at Hopkins, Martha Hill gave me a folder and she said, Trish, it's good to go. So who am I going to say no to Martha Hill, you know? Um, but it was a very smart move. I, I had to execute which was a lot harder. But um, basically Hopkins had been always a graduate school, um, probably since the 80s, a second degree program. So the, the sort of genesis of the master's entry at Hopkins sort of came after the Future of Nursing report. That, now that's not to say um, at Yale they've had a master's entry program for 30-odd years. But part of this was based upon the fact of you know, we can't have people in school forever. So, you know, me, I started a diploma program. I did a full bachelor's degree, another six years part-time, and then I did a master's, and then I did a PhD part-time. So by the time I entered the workforce, you know, I was pretty old. <laughs> so, you know, the great thing is that this master's entries program is firstly we could just attract the most amazing students, but they carry you know, credits forward to their TMP pro, pro, um, or PhD. Because, you know, students, you've got to really think about the market. You know, you don't pay the tuition and come to Hopkins if you want to go and work in one particular setting forever and not do anything. Um, so I would like to think my leadership was um, strategic, decisive, and you know, I do really care, but I'm not. I'm not naive enough to think that uh, everyone would share that as thoughts. But the what really brought me to Hopkins, and I haven't been disappointed, is this um, notion of excellence without elitism. Um, and you can't be based in East Baltimore without those core values. So, you know, you don't see any, you, look, I don't think you don't see any Mercedes Benzes cruising around the hospital or whatever. So, uh, and we, it's a very congested area. And I think across the schools of medicine, nursing, public health, people come to do the work. And a lot of people are infused by a commitment to social justice. So my standards are very high. And, um, and also one thing as a leader that I do, I, there's nothing that I can't do in the school. I, it's not saying I can't do everything well, but I teach, I research, and I still publish because I can't be saying to a new assistant professor, you need to publish or you need to write grants and you need to teach unless I'm prepared to do the same. So that's just my philosophy. And plus, I love that sort of work. Um, some of the students, I think, are more qualified to be the dean than me, you know, the, when they've got masters in finance and MBAs. Um, but, you know, you realise that you just have to have good people around you. Thank you. Um, so um, if you had um, one last 
advice for, um, since we're talking about mostly academia at this point, if you had one advice for individuals that are coming up through the ranks or getting into academia, because a lot of nurses are actually hesitant to come into academia because of not so much for the hours of work, but really the pay. The pay is really not um, equitable across the board compared to what individuals can be making working on the service side. Uh, if you had one advice for people thinking about getting into academia or just starting out in academia, what would it be? Well, I think there's nothing more motivating and inspiring by than thinking that you are preparing the next future leaders or the future nurses. Um, I can't tell you how many nurses have come to me and said, I remember that lecture you gave. And I'd really not thought about cardiology till then. So I just think there's not, it's, it's so rewarding and it's so satisfying. And it's, but it's not for everybody. Kathy Drake, again, when I first got my first faculty position, she said, Trish, this is one of the best jobs in the world. She said, you can come and go as you please. You can travel the world and you can work any 80 hours of the week you choose. Any 80 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an exaggeration. But I think I think that is really important because it emphasises that this is not just a nine-to-five job. The other thing that I really notice for people coming from the clinical side to the faculty side is that, you know, being an academic it's pretty solitary. So you're probably very suited, you know. So some people really don't like the loneliness. And that's probably not, I'm not sure if loneliness is the right word. But, you know, being a faculty member is a lot about being self-directed, self-motivated, focused, and spending a lot of time in your own head, in your own person. And that's kind of the opposite of the clinical world, which is highly collegial, very team-driven. Someone Often someone's telling you when to eat, drink, go to the bathroom. And so I find some people uh, find it difficult the other side. So um, if, I, if people are going to academia, I think the other thing is find a school where you feel comfortable with. Um, and there's some phenomenal community colleges that, prepare great nurses who where you might where you can go and teach and maybe the um, requirements for scholarship or leadership or service won't be as great but you know if you choose to go to um, you know a research intensive university you know make sure that you understand what's involved and you're committed to sign on and it's it's not necessarily for everybody, and I, that's I think that's part of the great things about I just see our students, the DMP and PhD students, going into amazing fields. You know, so it's not cut out for everybody, but for maybe people like you or me, it's the best job on the planet. And I just think I'm incredibly lucky. And going to you know when I if ever I feel bad about the world. You know, going into school and seeing these young, enthusiastic people, I never feel, I feel the future is bright. Um, Another thing at our school, no one's allowed to talk about generations because I don't believe in it, X, Y, Z, I just don't know. Um, Because I have just seen my students as being the most incredibly motivated, altruistic people so you know I hate all of this well they're gen x so they're going to behave like that I mean people have been selfish since Adam was born you know um so I I don't like those stereotypes and but probably one thing that I may be a bit different I I believe in very flat organizational structures and the other thing is about me so I was, I've never had a really traditional academic career either. So I kept, was a centre director. Um, so coming in and this very hierarchical thing has, is not good. We've dismantled our departments. I'm really happy about that. Um, and that was, the faculty came to that. Uh, and where possible, 
you know, if we can come together to make decisions. Although the faculty probably wouldn't always think that because sometimes I often think, you know, consensus means to many people I didn't get what I want. And, you know, as a leader, as the dean, you really have to make the best decision for everybody. And that can, that can, be, that can be tricky. Um, and particularly at times like this, you know, I really feel for many schools across the nation and the world, I think nobody knows what the current financial repercussions will be, what this is going to mean for nursing recruitment. I think we just work in really challenging times and I, I really feel for a lot of my colleagues who are in much more dire financial positions than, than you know, we are at the moment, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. Completely agree. So thank you so much. Uh, anything else you want to share? No, it's listener? been lovely to have it, a conversation and just be well, be safe, take care of yourself and your family. And if I really believe if you believe what you're doing is going to help patients, their families and communities, the rest will follow. And if people don't like you for that, that's their issue. <laughs> well, Dr. Davison, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, you have been listening to the RN Mentor Podcast. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.